Hi and welcome to the Open Tech Lab. So this is a little video about the Ekins HDMI microscope lens and camera that I've been playing around with. Now I got this kit pretty inexpensively on AliExpress and it includes the camera, the stand, the microscope lens and an LED illuminator ring. Now I've seen a few different kits on AliExpress and not all of them include the LED ring and having this is quite important as it turns out because without it you won't see anything through the microscope at all, you'll just get a big black image. Now most of the LED rings out there seem to have adjustable intensity and if you crank this one all the way up it puts out an absolute ton of light. And the bit of Chinese translation on the side just adds to the charm of it in my opinion. Now weirdly the base seems to have some slots for some connectors of some kind. Maybe this moulding is used in a model that has some extra features. Maybe the most annoying aspect of this package is that they didn't send me a version that had UK mains connectors on it. So I had to fit one onto the LED ring. And as it turns out the Ekins camera can be powered off a phone charger with the right adapters. So without further ado, let's test it out. So here I have the camera and I've got a $1 bill on the plate. So let's have a look through the lens and see what kind of image we get. Okay, so now let's bring this into focus. And there you are, we're at a medium level of zoom here. So now if I lower the camera down and then refocus it, let's try and see if we can get it to the maximum zoom that it will give us in focus. There we are. That's pretty close up. Now the image is looking a bit overexposed, so let's dial down the LED ring and that should stop it looking so burned out. There we go, those colours are looking much, much better. Now of course I got the microscope so I could see close up on various electronic devices. So here I have a little mini PCI Express solid state hard disk. So let's get that under the lens and see what it looks like. So if I bring the lens into focus, you can see everything on the board coming through clearly. So this is a 720p image at 60 frames a second, which as far as I'm concerned is good enough quality that you could get better if you're prepared to spend more money. But uh, for something cheap and uh, easily available from China, I think this is pretty good. And the main issue would be if there was any lag uh, latency here, but I found testing it with a TV that because there's no buffering inside the camera and no buffering inside the TV, the latency is very, very low, certainly fast enough to work underneath the lens. Okay, so let's lower the camera down to give us the maximum zoom that this lens will allow us once again. And there you can see we have a really, really close up image there of what's on the board. So this kit contains the 100 times lens and we're looking at 0402 resistors here. That is there a millimeter by half a millimeter in scale. So now I'm going to put a ruler under the lens to see what kind of magnification we're getting. And you can see here at maximum zoom, the image covers about three millimeters just over across the full width. And then if I zoom the camera all the way out to minimum zoom, lift it all the way up to the top, you can see the image is about 18 millimeters across. Now the most demanding test of any microscope comes when we have it zoomed into the maximum level. And here you can see that the image we're getting is not flawless. There's a bit of chromatic aberration going on around the corners here. And this is caused by the differences in refractive index of the glass between red and blue light. And because these two are not being uh, lensed exactly the same. They are split out into their component colors a little bit in the final image. Now more expensive and more sophisticated lenses will have ways of correcting for this and this is just one of the limitations of a more entry-level lens of this kind. So the main reason I got this device was so that I could include microscope imagery inside my videos and for that purpose it seems to be working pretty well. I'm just taking the HDMI signal and feeding it into an HDMI capture device. So now let's have a bit of fun putting a few things under the microscope and if I put this microfiber cloth from my glasses case under the lens we can clearly see the weave pattern coming through and we can even see the pattern of halftone ink dots that we use to print on the stripy pattern. Next up I've got this downy feather under the lens and as we adjust the focus we can see the complex structure of fibres that make it up. 
And finally, I've got a zoomed up view of my mobile phone screen. And this is an OLED display, which is made up of millions of tiny little LEDs. And you can see the individual LED elements in red, green and blue. Now, if I pull up the on-screen menu here, there's nothing particularly interesting apart from that I've got the sharpness filter dialed down to zero. And the one-click and auto white balance features allow you to set the white balance. I've got a reference gray card under the lens here. So with the white balance enabled, suddenly it will correct for the lighting color of the LED ring. So next I decided to do a little teardown and as you can see it's pretty easy to get into, nice simple construction and it consists of a buttons board mounted on the back plate and this is wired through to the main board that has uh, most of the complexity on it and then there's a little sensor board on the front wired through with a ribbon cable and if we remove the ribbon cable then we can get access to the sensor and get a nice close look at it. Now if we take a close look at the sensor die here, you can see that it's got a 16 by 9 sensor format and the die is wire bonded onto a little carrier board and with a little piece of glass on the front, this makes it into a little surface mount module which is then surface mounted onto the PCB. Now one thing I was expecting was a whole load more connections, I was expecting a wide parallel bus to uh, send the video signal out and this seems to get away with very very few connections indeed which suggests that this device is communicating with some kind of serial interface but I haven't exactly figured out what that is at the moment. So here I have some high resolution pictures of the main board and if you want to grab these they are available to download from the show notes. Now for whatever reason the manufacturer has decided to remove the chip markings from several of the larger devices on the board which is rather annoying. The only chip that has its markings intact is this Lattice SII9022 HDMI transmitter which drives the HDMI output. But even with the markings removed it seems reasonably clear to see how this board is set up. So here is the ribbon cable that connects through to the sensor and you can see the digital uh, pins coming through from the sensor and connecting into this big quad flat pack into them in the middle and this seems to be some kind of digital image media processor and this uh, takes the image in from the sensor and uh, processes it and then it connects through to the HDMI transmitter and it also connects I think to the VGA output as well. Now in addition to this we have over here the connector which connects through to the buttons and these pins are wired through to this little chip up here and I believe this is a little microcontroller that runs the software of the device and I think this device puts the menu up on the screen. So I would say it seems likely that the media processor in the middle has some kind of character generator and it can do overlays on top of the imagery that's coming through and this microcontroller just sends commands to the media processor as you push buttons to update the text on the screen. And then I would expect this uh, device in the middle to have support for all the color correction and uh, sharpening and various filters that the device supports and so this is what conditions the image into what we see in the output. And then all that we have up here is a bit of power conditioning. And then down here, this chip is not lasered, but it's also unmarked. But I think it's pretty safe to assume that it's, it looks like it's just an I squared C uh, EEPROM that's used to store the user configuration as you change things in the menu. Now one of the things that first attracted me to this kit is that this is a C-mount microscope lens and the Ekins camera is a C-mount camera. And C-mount is a standard that's used in many lenses, most uh, often in CCTV lenses. And so there's a wide variety of lenses on the market at a very low price. And it was also one of the early formats used in early cinema. So we can take off the C-mount microscope lens here and attach it to any other C-mount camera. And we could equally take any C-mount lens and attach it to the Ekins camera and see how it performs. Now my main camera that I use for recording on this channel is a Panasonic G7 which is a micro four thirds mount camera and so we can attach C mount lenses to micro four thirds with an adapter ring just like this one. So to plug the microscope into the camera all we have to do is screw it into the adapter and then plug the adapter into the camera. Now having this lens on the front of the camera like this feels seriously weird to hold and it's not really going to work. There's no way we can hold the camera still enough to take pictures in point and shoot mode and there's no way we'll have enough light without the LED ring attached. So we need to get the camera mounted up in the stand. 
So if we have a look at some of the captured imagery here, you can see the results near the center of the frame are looking quite good and nicely in focus. But as we progress towards the edges, we can see a variety of problems are really ruining the results completely, including vignetting, chromatic aberration, and lens distortion. So there's not really much use for this imagery near the edges. And the reason for this is that the micro four thirds sensor size is 17.3 millimeters wide versus the sensor on the Ekins camera which is only three and a half millimeters wide and so we're seeing a lot of light uh, coming from the microscope lens that would normally dis be discarded around the edges by the Ekins camera. Now one thing we can do is use a bit of digital zoom to simulate having a smaller sensor in the Panasonic G7 and this works because the sensor although it's 17.3 millimeters across it's also four and a half thousand pixels across and we only need a 1920 pixel image which means we can cut out an area right in the center of the sensor and use that as our capture area rather than using the full area of the sensor with all the lens distortion effects around the outside edges so looking at the results I have here, the results I'm getting with the digital zoom are not too bad and I think it might provide a useful way to take microscope footage to include in these videos. But now let's try a few other lenses and as it happens I'm in fact the proud owner of a small family of C-mount lenses, all of them CCTV lenses of different focal lengths. So let's see what we can do if we attach these to the G7 and to the Ekins camera. Now one of the problems I've encountered when trying to attach other lenses to this camera is that it lacks the mounting hole that's necessary to attach it to a tripod. And so I've had to come up with a bit of a plan for how we can modify this thing to attach the quarter inch 20 thread that's commonly found on most other cameras. So the camera is built out of a piece of aluminium extrusion and two end plates that are bolted together in a sandwich. So my plan is to insert some 3D printed pieces that will sit between the layers and then these will slot together with a base piece that will go underneath and this contains a hole that's the right size for a captive nut to sit inside it and then this whole thing assembled together will then screw onto the tripod base. Now to do this project I did all the design work here in FreeCAD 0.17, the latest release, and I was very very pleased with the results. There is a great improvement in the stability and performance of FreeCAD uh, part design workbench in 0.17. If you've used it previously and found it frustrating as I have, it's well worth another look in this release. And here I've got the assembled parts in the Assembly 2 workbench, which is a, a third party workbench that's available for FreeCAD that adds some pretty usable assembly mode functionality. So I'm very pleased with uh, how this all worked out. Now doing the assembly is ever so slightly fiddly but nothing that can't be completed in a couple of minutes and if you're interested in building one of these for yourself all the design files are available in the show notes. So now I've got the frame assembled, I can go ahead and attach this thing into a tripod. So here I've got the camera attached to a tripod and as you can see I've pointed it at a couple of ornaments and I've attached a CCTV lens to the front. Now this is a Pelco branded 3 to 8 millimeter zoom lens with manual focus and manual aperture. So let's see what kind of image we get out of it. So you can see the results we're getting here are pretty uninspiring, lots of bloom and vignetting and lens distortion. But if we try it at a higher level of zoom, the quality does improve a little bit. So now let's try attaching the lens to the front of the G7. And again, it looks seriously weird having this lens attached to the front of a camera like this. And the results are rather disappointing. As you can see, this lens was never designed to project an image onto a sensor so large as one you would find in a micro four thirds camera, which is why we only get a circle of image in the middle of the frame. And try as I might, I found no way of bringing the image into focus. Now, actually, it's not quite true to say that it's not possible to focus the image because if you take the aperture and close it right down to the minimum setting and then boost up the sensitivity of the sensor to the highest ISO setting, effectively what we've built here is a little pinhole camera and in this case the glass is not actually doing, doing anything. It could be removed from the lens entirely and it would work just as well. And you can see even doing this the results are pretty poor. 
Next up, I've got this big beast. This is a Pentax C60812 zoom lens, 8 to 48 millimeters, so that's quite a wide zoom range. And this thing is seriously chunky and heavy. It's made of steel, I think. And uh, looking through, it's really nicely made. And I'm really glad I found this thing. It was in the uh, metal recycling at work, and I'm glad I saved it from being thrown out because it's worth about two or three hundred dollars. Now it's worth mentioning that C-mount is a standard that has been implemented in a variety of different ways in different products. And particularly in CCTV lenses and cameras, you find that they often use CS mount, which is the same as C-mount, but with the lens mounted five millimeters closer to the sensor. And this is sometimes done to improve the compactness of the camera. And so it's easy enough to convert C-mount lenses and cameras between each other using a little adapter ring like this one. And I found that in general it's worth having a few of these. You can pick them up pretty inexpensively on AliExpress because some lenses and some cameras can be quite touchy and so having a bit of offset can be useful to try and get the lens to go into focus. So here I've got the lens screwed onto the front of the Ekins camera and I'm using the CS mount adapter ring. Now strictly speaking this shouldn't be necessary because this is a C mount lens and a C mount camera. But I'm using it in this case as a macro adapter ring to help the lens focus at a shorter range so I can get some close up footage. And as you can see, we're getting an absolutely beautiful image of the glass vessels within this Galileo thermometer. And there's absolutely no comparison to the quality of the image from that cheap plasticky Pelco lens. Now, if you haven't played with one of these Galileo thermometers before, they're pretty gorgeous to look at. The glass vessels float up and down inside depending on the temperature, and it makes for an excellent subject for a bit of lens testing. So I'm curious to find out what the result will be if we mount this lens on the front of the G7 camera. But already we're not off to a good start because I had to use the CS mount adapter ring even though I don't want to. And it's necessary because otherwise the lens doesn't physically fit on the front of the Micro Four Thirds adapter. I needed to use the CS mount adapter ring to add a few millimeters of standoff so the lens would fit inside. Now, if we take a look at the resulting imagery, you can see, just as before, the projected image isn't large enough to cover the whole G7 sensor, and the focus we're getting is pretty poor at all levels of zoom. So, slightly disappointing result. Next up, I'd like to try this Megapix 1.8 to 3mm lens. That's an extremely wide-angle lens, but still not a fisheye lens, which will mean it produces a really interesting image. The problem is it's not going to work with the Ekins camera because this lens has an automatic aperture which is driven by a DC voltage put into this uh, little wire here and uh, cameras that are capable of uh, driving this thing like uh, CCTV cameras have the ability to control the aperture but the Ekins camera does not so it won't work. Now as it happens I actually have a few security cameras lying around. This is an Axis IP box camera. Axis are a leading manufacturer of security cameras in the industry and this is an HD 1080p camera and it has support for the DC iris that we need so we can just plug this in here and then we can give it a try. Now as you can see this lens is giving us an incredibly wide angle image. I've only got the camera about a meter away from the table here and you can see it's giving us a complete panorama from one side of the room to the other which is really quite remarkable. So I think the effective field of view must be well over 120 degrees and it does that without having any kind of fisheye effect. So if I move my hand over here you can see there's an interesting shape formed by my fingers as, uh, as a consequence of having a lens projection of this kind. Now if you are curious the answer is yes you can mount the microscope lens on the front of an IP box camera and it might be a useful way of having microscope imagery sent across a network because of course this plugs into Ethernet. Finally, this is another little lens that I love. This is a Fujinon 75mm telephoto lens. And just like the Pentax, this is one that I rescued from the metal recycling at work. And I'm very glad I did so. I love this thing. It feels so solidly constructed. And the optics inside are just 
gorgeous. Look at that, really, really nice. So if we take the lens and attach it to the Ekins camera and poke it out the window, you can see it's giving us this nice image of this microwave transceiver. And I believe this is the link that's providing my internet service. Then if I take the lens and point it out of the other window, you can see that it's giving us this gorgeous view of these distant wind turbines. And these are about three and a half miles away. So at the end of all this, I've definitely had a good time playing around with this kit, and it is certainly a great improvement over the $30 USB 2.0 microscope that I've been using up until this point. And overall, I'd say this kit, and particularly the lens, is well worth having. Well, that's about it for this video. I hope you found it interesting. And I want to give a big thank you to all the patrons who are supporting this channel via Patreon. I really appreciate the support. And it's been a while since I put out my last video, and it feels really good to be making videos again. And I've got a lot of cool stuff in the pipeline. So stay tuned, and I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.